surgery at the eye care clinic. The part-time ophthalmologist at Clemenceau Medical Center affiliated with John Hopkins International. She has general medicine and ophthalmology training from the American University of Beirut. She did a fellowship in oculoplastic, lacrimal, and orbital surgery, including endoscopic uh, techniques at the Orbital Center of the Academic Medical Center, University of Amsterdam. She is also an associate member of the European Society of Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. Dr. Jordi, please, you may now proceed with your presentation. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, VCA, for hosting. Always a pleasure to co collaborate with you. So today we're going to talk about aesthetics in ophthalmology. Uh, it's um, not very commonly talked about, so I hope I will be able to give you some insights, as I think uh, most of our attendees are optometrists, if I'm not mistaken. So I'll do my best to show things from your perspective perspective, but uh, we're going to go briefly over everything. So first of all, uh, this is our agenda. We're going to discuss about uh, a little bit about oculoplastics, because as I said, it's relatively a rare subspecialty and not everybody knows exactly what we do. So I'm going to tell you about that. Then we're going to go over the aging phase, uh, how the aging process has happens, how things change, um, how it, it's very important to understand the changes in order to know how we can best address them. And the way to address them is via three means, which are medical, procedural, and surgical rejuvenation. We're going to go over every single one on its own. And I will point out the transitions, of course. So. What is oculoplastic surgery? Oculoplastic surgery, basically, it's a medical doctor who went through ophthalmology residency training. That means four years, following which we do an oculoplastic surgery fellowship, which can go from anywhere one up to three or four years. Uh, it's the surgeon who really decides how deep they want to go, because as you can see in this slide, it's much wider than you would imagine. It is composed of three main sections. First of all, the eyelid and then the lacrimal system, and then the orbit. Uh, now, the lacrimal system and the orbit are outside the scope of this presentation, but I just, as I said, I just want you to know exactly what oculoplastic surgery is. You will frequently find, um, I don't know any orbital surgeon who is not an oculoplastic surgeon, but I do know oculoplastic surgeons who are not orbital surgeons, so you also have to be careful with that. Oculoplastic surgery will mo mostly involve the eyelid, and since we are talking about cosmetics and aging today, we're going to be covering a very small introduction regarding the eyelid cosmetic part. So the eyelid will have cosmetic and functional uh, issues. We are going to focus more on the cosmetic. As they say, the eyes are the windows to the soul. So that's the first thing that people notice about your face. And it's gonna tell them more or less whether you look younger or older. It can make you look tired. It can make you look uh, relaxed. So uh, all of these are factors that we look at and address when we are dealing with cosmetic eyelid procedures. It can significantly improve. Uh, we, can, we can do uh, wrinkles, whether they're um, active wrinkles or passive wrinkles. We're gonna go more over that in a bit puffy eyelids or bags under the eyes, commonly expressed as bags under the eyes. And variable procedures will give you variable results, variable success rates, as well as variable duration of the effect of your treatment. It can be months, as in Botox, or it can be uh, years, as in blepharoplasty, which is a surgical intervention. We're also going to go over that. So what is the secret of having a young face? Uh, the youthful look primarily depends on fat, facial fat in the right place. Some areas with age are gonna lose fat, namely the upper face, and the lower face will be gaining fat. And this will change the shape of the face. I have a laser pointer here somewhere. So as you can see, this V shape, this nice V shape, which we call heart shaped face. This is our goal when we are talking about cosmetics because this is the useful look by definition. 
With age, this V, this nice V, will become a reverse V, as you can see here, because the bulk is going down. So it's a triangle with the base inferiorly as opposed to a triangle with the base superiorly. And this is due to many things, namely redistribution, accumulation of fat, and atrophy of the fat, as well as the bone resorption. It's not just the fat that's going to change place or appear in other places more than others. It's also fat atrophy, muscle atrophy, and bone resorption. So the whole structure of the face is changing. It's kind of imagine that it's shrinking, and the skin over it is becoming more lax and moving along with the co new contours that are for forming in the face. The way I like to explain it to patients is, is um, think of a car. So the car might have scratches, it might look dull, it might have uh, water splashes, and it can also have dents. The dents are because of this volume deficiency, which is very important all through our talk uh, about cosmetics. So with age, we will have all these changes and all these changes can be summed actually in one thing, reduction of collagen. With age, we start losing some of our collagen and we lose the ability to manufacture collagen at the appropriate rate to make up for the losses. When we look at the face and talk about cosmetics, we are basically assessing lines. Lines is what we do. You look at fine lines, coarse lines, where are they? Right eds, right eds meaning um, this excessive sagging in the lower eyelid bags, secondary to laxity in all the tissue. You can see laxity in the orbicularis muscle will happen in addition to the cantal tendon and all the attachments around the eye. So another one uh, of, the, of the changes you will notice are going to be in the temporal area, the, the here, the forehead, the temples, we call them. This is one of the first areas that loses fat in the face, along with the tear trough, which we will also go over, which is the area under your eye, which will be of more concern for you as an optometrist when, when patients come to you. So with age, the skin will become thinner, drier, less elastic, and hence we will see more wrinkles and sagging in the face. So let's talk more about collagen. Uh, so collagen basically keeps things together. It is the most abundant molecule in the body, actually. It keeps things tight. It keeps things firm. And our body actually starts producing less collagen starting in our 20s and 30s. So that's much earlier than you would imagine. However, the effects only start to show decades later. So it's a very slow process. And if you start at the very beginning, start addressing it at the very beginning, you can delay aging by a significant amount of time and you will need much less procedures. So awareness here is very important about that. So collagen um, decreases with age, as we said, as well as sun exposure, it will break down. And once the collagen breaks down, the quality of the skin changes and we get wrinkles and we lose the plumpness and we lose this um, uh, glow of the face, healthy look of the face. Um, now, the, the thing about collagen is uh, there are ways uh, to boost it, but we cannot boost collagen with, with, with collagen. One of the best ways to boost collagen is actually the use of hyaluronic acid because hyaluronic acid stimulates production of collagen and helps retain collagen. There, so uh, there's someone who is not on mute. Just uh, We will have time for questions in the end, so please mute your windows in the meantime. Uh, so hyaluronic acid helps retain collagen, it helps retain moisture, it actually, the, the hyaluronic acid molecule is able to absorb up to 1000 times its weight in water, and that's why it gives us this plumpiness, this uh, healthy look in the face, this volume. It also helps with redness, wrinkles, and dermatitis, as I said, a healthy glow, and it will make it smoother. So we'll talk a little bit more about the aging phase and we will address two parts. We have the intrinsic skin aging and extrinsic skin aging. Intrinsic 
skin aging is inevitable. It's, we will all age, we're all gonna get older, we're all gonna see changes. Those changes are gonna start, as I said, in our 20s, but we see them way, way after that. And the genetic makeup of the person will affect this. So you have to keep that in mind when talking to patients. If someone comes to you with really big uh, lower lid, you know, bags, fat prolapse at the age of 40, that looks like someone at age 60, this is probably genetic. And we have to have realistic expectations. Some people, maybe they want a you know, a V-shaped face, but they have a round face. I have a round face. I got it from my mom. This cannot be changed. So some things can be addressed. Some things cannot be addressed. You cannot change the shape of the face, but you can keep the volume where you want it, which is more in the upper face. And that's where the discussion comes uh, when explaining things to patients. Extrinsic skin aging, and that's where you can actually do something. Sun is the most important thing. Photo exposure, we will go into more detail about that. Smoking, of course, smoking will cause vasoconstriction, decrease blood supply to, to the skin and cause a less healthy look. Uh, malnutrition, vitamins, very important. Hormonal disorders, that's why the skin quality decreases a lot after 45, 50, because women will go into menopause and estrogen actually uh, stimulates fibroblasts to produce collagen and that will decrease or kind of stop working more or less. Uh, chronic disease states as well, uh, gravity. Simply gravity is gonna pull everything down. Uh, also, there are uh, repetitive facial expressions. For example, there are people who frown more than others. And if they frown more frequently, they're gonna have lines on their glabella, which is here, the frown area. And they will, these will be more prominent. Uh, some people smile a lot, uh, never avoid smiling for wrinkles. Uh, we call them crow's feet or smile, uh, smile lines. We will see examples of those in a bit. So a couple of myths that I would really like to address here. Um, very important because as I said, skin care starts very early on. We can delay aging as much as possible. Uh, so many people think you can't get sunburned in the shade. This is not true because actually it's the UV radiation and not sunlight itself that damages your skin. Uh, UV radiation cannot be seen. There's UVA and UVB. The UVB is the one that causes the blistering and the you know, slight burn when you go to the beach. Whereas the UVA is the one that penetrates deeper than the epidermis and goes into all the la layers of the skin and causes aging. And this will give a more coarse look to the skin if you look at it, it, it looks, sunbeat uh, with, with over time. Uh, so they're very important, even if you're sitting in the shade, even if it's not sun sunny, as the second, uh, the, the right uh, column says, even if it's um, not sunny and you're sitting in the shade, UV radiation can bounce off surfaces. You cannot see it, you cannot feel it. It doesn't even give you heat. So it's gonna be bouncing off surfaces and coming right back at your face and your body. So very important, not just to use protection for your face, go with hats, long sleeves for people with very fair skin to avoid burns and the like. So this lady here, this lovely lady here on the right says the secret to staying young is to live honestly, eat slowly and lie about your age. Now I will never uh, you know, discourage a woman from lying about her age, but I would prefer that we preserve things so well that she doesn't feel the need to have to and to actually be proud of her age. Some very uh, seemingly simple advice, but also very important as we said, very important protection on the face, 30 SPF or higher is recommended by the American Academy of Dermatology. However, I personally use 50 SPF on a daily basis, summer or winter, it doesn't matter. Daily, whether you're at home or going out, it doesn't matter. Uh, as we said, smoking, healthy diet, these are, you know, like um, reflexive. These are easy for you to figure out. Uh, but you also need to know that there are many things you can use over the counter to maintain your skin. You're 20 years old. You're not going to go to the dermatologist or oculoplastic surgeon telling them, you know what, I don't want my age to face, to, to my, my face to age. Not all people 
have this kind of access to physicians. That, that's a kind of luxury. So you should know and advise your patients as optometrists when they ask you, how can I decrease wrinkles around my eyes? How can I improve the appearance of my eyes? You can tell them you can use retinoic acid, which is over-the-counter uh, over retinol. And this will help promote collagen growth and it will minimize oil, pro oil production and improve the quality of your skin. A very, very simple trick that you can do on a daily basis, men or women, doesn't matter. Vitamin C, the usual vitamin C, el fawar, that we take when we get a cold, just one, once daily will give you a very nice glow to your skin. So these are remedies that you can do mostly for your younger patients or patients looking to improve the glow in their face. And these are actually much more helpful than you think. And then we go to the more complicated things, which are hyaluronic acid, mesotherapy, etc. And then we will start intervening procedurally. So medical intervention is what you do. It's the creams, it's the protection, it's the retinol, it's the vitamin C, uh, good skin hygiene, good, good face hygiene. A cleansing ritual should be part of your daily ritual. Every evening, just like you brush your teeth, you should cleanse your face, whether you had makeup on or not. That's very important. You need to open the pores so that when you put your night cream on to moisturize the area, the pores are open to absorb all of that. Otherwise, it's pretty useless. So these are very helpful uh, tricks that you can uh, teach your, your clients. And um, this, I like this uh, picture here. It says that uh, nature gives you the face you have at 20 but it's up to you to determine what kind of face you're gonna have at 50. So these are very relatively simple tricks to follow to maintain quality of skin. So uh, looking at the ladies at the top, uh, you can understand that the aging process can be quite traumatic. This is Brigitte Bardot on the left. Uh, she decided to age naturally, which is fine, nothing wrong with that. I'm just showing you how the face will look. As you can see again here, we lost the beautiful V-shape, the heart-shaped face here, it's gone. We have jowls, these are called jowls, these uh, fatty protrusions down there. Whereas if you take good care of your skin, stick to procedures, whether it's Botox, whether it's mesotherapy, whether it's fillers and, and shaping, contouring or threads, you can maintain the shape of the face in a very natural way. It's very natural. You can't tell that she's done anything. Unlike this lady here, you can clearly see that a lot of things have been done and not necessarily in the correct way. So our goal is a natural look. Anna, especially Blibnan, they freak out because they worry about this look. But this look is not what you should expect when you go to a well-trained uh, oculoplastic surgeon or dermatologist or plastic surgeon. This is not the goal. This is the goal, like Jennifer Aniston, uh, Aniston here. You can barely tell the difference between 20 and 50. And these are relatively non-invasive procedures um, that are done in clinic under, under local anesthesia or no anesthesia, such as Botox, for example. So we talked about medical rejuvenation. Now we're gonna go to the more complex parts and that's where the oculoplastic surgeon roles uh, will become more prominent. And uh, clients uh, that you get as optometrists are gonna need your guidance here. The common questions that you're gonna get, what do I do about the dark circles around my eyes? What do I do about the bags under my eyes? What do I do about the sagginess of my upper lids? I can't see well on the sides because of the saggy skin. So these are the kinds of complaints that you're gonna get and you have to know how to answer them. Even, first of all, you need to know that you have to refer to an oculoplastic surgeon, not, not just any ophthalmologist for, for these things, particularly the more advanced oculoplastic procedures like blepharoplasty and ptosis repair. Ptosis repair, believe me, even plastic surgeons run away from them, especially plastic surgeons actually. And we get some disasters when patients go to the wrong people. And then when we have to repair, it's much harder. We're gonna show those as we go. So among the procedural rejuvenations, we have mesotherapy, Botox fillers, and thread lifting. 
Among the surgical rejuvenation options, only a few would be, and again, I'm talking cosmetic, not functional. Functionally, you're going to have ectropion, entropion, etc. Here, we're going to talk blepharoplasty, rhytidectomy, or a mid facelift for the rhytids that I showed you before, ptosis repair, as we already mentioned, brow lift, and in some cases, eyelid crease revision. Uh, I will focus in this talk more on blepharo, uh, blepharoplasty and ptosis repair, as these two can be both cosmetic and functional, and you are very likely to get questions about those. I'm going to cover mesotherapy very briefly. It's here for completion because it's part of the procedural rejuvenation that we do in clinic. It's basically a cocktail of vitamins. Okay, so it's vitamin growth factors, sometimes a little bit of hyaluronic acid thrown in. And the job of this cocktail of, of, um, of uh, over 100 ingredients sometimes will help hydrate, rejuvenate, and tighten. And this gives you an instant glow. Uh, this is helpful for ladies who are with us now. This is a quick fix. This is a very quick fix. If you have a wedding in a couple of months and you want your face to look at its best, and then I would recommend mesotherapy. But you have to you know, budget your time. You need two, three sessions, and then you will have a glowing face for, for your events, in addition to maintenance of your skin. These are all pluses uh, over and above that. Mesotherapy can help with wrinkles and with glow mostly, okay? We can also use it for other, other things like hyperpigmentation, acne. As you can see in this picture here, double chin. So there are some meso treatments which we can inject and cause fat, re fat, fat resorption, which will reshape your skin and give you that nice V again that we're talking about. And you lose this double, double skin fold here, the double chin. So that's for mesotherapy, as I said, very brief. Now we go to everybody's favorite treatment, my favorite treatment at least, Botox. Uh, Botox is one of the most widely researched medication. Not a single person here has never heard of Botox, I am sure. It was first approved for actually two eye muscle disorders. So this is a drug primarily made for ophthalmologists. We kind of uh, hold uh, hold on to them. The two conditions that it was approved for in 1989 by the FDA were blepharospasm and strabismus. And then after that, FDA started approving it for other uh, all kinds of other uses. Um, what is how do we get Botox? It's basically a drug that is made from a toxin that is produced by a bacteria. The same bacteria is the one that causes botulism in humans. There are seven types. Excuse me. There are uh, seven, uh, seven types, actually, seven forms of Botox, but we use only forms A and B. The mechanism by which, uh, by which uh, Botox act, acts, you can see it here in this diagram, it uh, binds presynaptically to cholinergic nerve terminals, meaning it prevents the release of acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is the primary molecule responsible for muscle contraction. So basically what we're doing is temporary paralysis of the muscle. That's what Botox does. It causes paralysis. But you don't want to say paralysis to patients. It's going to freak them out. The word is not, it's not nice to hear. So we tend to tell them, you know, temporary reversible relaxation of the muscles to prevent wrinkles. As I said, forms A and B are the ones that we use. Form A is the one that we use for cosmetic procedures, which is what I mostly use. Form B is for different types of muscle diseases uh, like chronic migraine, spasticity, and even axillary hyperhidrosis, meaning sweaty armpits. And it's, it does miracles with that, really. Uh, mostly dermatologists are going to do that. I, I wouldn't go to, the, for, to use the, the second form. It's really not my area. But form A is for, for all the cosmetics in the face. Now, what about safety? In the right hand, Botox is actually one of the safest drugs that you can administer, uh, provided it's done by someone who is experienced. Uh, there are possible side effects. I do warn my patients about them all the time. Most of them very rarely happen. The most common would be probably headache on, on the day of injection. They get headaches and I warn them about that. They can just take Panadol and that's it. Pain, swelling, or bruising is quite rare with Botox injections. Unlike with fillers, we get them in about 20% of filler injections. And 
The tricky part is the crow's feet, the smile lines. Uh, injections in that area are very close to the eye and you really want an oculoplastic surgeon to do that for you. Because if you go too close or use a product like this port instead of Botox that migrates much faster and you don't have knowledge of all of this, you will have ptosis. And if it's a, fine, it's reversible, it's not a big deal. It's gonna go back to normal in three to 12 months, normally in six to, three, uh, six to 12 weeks for ptosis. But imagine you're going for a cosmetic procedure to feel better about yourself. And maybe you even have a wedding, you have a party to go to. And then you see that your eyelid drops down. It's quite traumatic and very alarming for the patient. And you really wanna avoid these from happening. That's why it's very important to know your anatomy, to know your area and to know your product. Uh, the more dangerous areas for Botox injections in terms of complications, not dangerous in any other sense, are the lower face. Lower face is more difficult to inject. And if done in an improper way, you can get a crooked smile or sometimes even drooling. They cannot really control their mouth movements. Uh, now, Botox done improperly or on the forehead, for example, can ca cause a witch look. I call it a witch look. So you get the eyebrow looking like this, like, like an ape. And this is not the result that you're supposed to see. And some people see this very frequently and think that this is what it should look like. And this is what they don't want. And hence they shy away from Botox. So you need to explain that when it's done properly, this should not happen. Why would eye dryness or excessive tearing happen because of Botox? Just think about it for one second before I tell you. So basically, when you're injecting close to the eye, if you're going close to the lower lid, as when we go with crow's feet, sometimes I go to the upper cheek, you may cause lower lid ectropion because of weakening and paralysis of the orbicularis muscle. And then you will get excessive dryness, excessive tearing, scleral show, and this will be a nightmare for the patient from a symptomatic point of view, not just a cosmetic point of view. Many areas that you can inject uh, with Botox. You have the forehead lines, as you can see, uh, frown lines, as we said. We can also lift, uh, let me use the pointer, I can help you better. So, forehead lines, this is the area. You have the frown lines, this is the glabellar area for the frown. You, have, you can lift the eyebrow a little bit by injecting here. Crow's feet, uh, smiling uh, uh, lines, smiling wrinkles are right here. Lower eyelid wrinkles injecting here, as I said, can cause ectropion if you don't do it properly. Bunny lines, bunny lines are on the nose. And then we go to the lower face. Laugh often, even if you get wrinkles, I fix them for you. Laugh often, you only grow old when you stop laughing. So what causes crow's feet or the smile lines? Uh, facial expressions, as we already covered, sleeping position, if you sleep flat on your face, flat on your eye, and you're causing all this strain on your skin. Sunlight, which causes loss of collagen. All of these are gonna contribute. Now, what kind of results can we get for crow's feet with Botox? Uh, please note all these are my patients and I have explicit uh, consent from them to share these photos with you. So these two ladies have crow's feet and as you, you can see they come in different shapes and forms. This lady has it, uh, the first one has it all over the place. You can see it's extending all the way to the lower lid. This lady has it mostly here. So after injection, this is the result after two weeks when smiling, you can no longer see these smiling lines. And this gives you a more relaxed version of your face and gives you a, lo a, a younger look. The other two areas that we do uh, in the upper face for Botox are the forehead, as you can see in the first one on your left here. These are the forehead linkers. This is two weeks after a Botox injection. This is the frown two weeks after a Botox injection. So as you can see, we get really beautiful results in a relatively very safe procedure. It's very, very rewarding. And you might think that these are minor issues, but I get many people telling me, young, young people mostly, for example, they would tell me, I look angry all the time. People tell me that I look angry. It's mostly because maybe they frown more frequently than other people. And this is causing lines to show all the time and permanent lines will make you look angry all the time. And Botox can help with that. 
Now, before I go on to fillers, I want to uh, cover one thing in the, in the types of, uh, of wrinkles. So we have something we call active wrinkles, and that is mainly addressed by Botox. Active wrinkles are wrinkles upon expression. So when you smile, when you smile, the wrinkles that you see on the spot are active wrinkles. If I'm not smiling and you can still see the wrinkles, these are passive wrinkles. Not using Botox at the right time, not starting at the right time when you first see them. And then the wrinkles will settle in deeper and you will have these deeper um, uh, wrinkles that Botox will not address. And this is where you might need fillers, okay? In addition to uh, fine lines as well. Now, what about fillers? Uh, you would be surprised how many people have no idea what the difference between Botox and fillers are. So you will get a client coming to you. Doctor, uh, Botox, okay? So I will show you exactly how to assess as an optometrist to at least be able to guide and predict their treatment and show that you're knowledgeable. You know where you're sending them. You know what to expect out of, out of their treatment. So the filler's job is like its name, filling. So it fills volume. Filler gives us volume. Botox gets rid of active wrinkles. So these are the two key things to explain to your clients. There are so many types of thermal fillers, uh, not the least of which is, is radius, which is the hydroxyl appetite, the, the, more, the more heavy stuff, if you will, for facial contouring, the semi-permanent fillers, the permanent fillers, which I do not recommend. But the most commonly used thermal filler is hyaluronic acid. It's by far the best, most commonly used and the safest. And I currently use this exclusively in, in my practice. It can not only give you volume, it can give you an improved contour and decrease scarring, injury, uh, injury signs or lines. So you can also use them for smoker lines, for example. Uh, and any remnant lines, the passive lines that remain after Botox, you can address that with fillers as well. So as an optometrist, this is what you're going to get. You're going to get the main complaint is going to be in the area under the eye. OK, so you are dealing with the eye. The patient is going to come in. And if you look here, you see an obvious concavity. There is a volume deficiency. There's a farah. There's a jura. There's um, shadowing. And you can see like the area looks darker than it should. So looking at this lady, you are assessing, OK, in 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 your clinic, you are assessing this patient as an optometrist. What would you say? I will help you in the first one. You're gonna help me more in the second one. At least think out loud with me. So this can easily be solved just by filling the volume deficiency. This area here, I injected filler. And as you can see, this is the result after. Not only do you lose the concavity and you get more volume, you also notice the skin will have a more glowing look, a more comfortable look. And the dark color, the dark circles will also decrease. Now, of course, it always helps when you have a young, beautiful patient like this lady in, in the second uh, uh, photo that I'm sharing right now. Uh, looking at her, what would you think? Let's think. Do you see the groove? Let's start thinking this way. Do you see the groove that we saw in the, fir uh, in the first patient or not? I will show you. Here it is. There is a groove. Do you see the dark circles? Yes, you do. Look at the darkness around the eye. Do you see fine lines? No, because she's young. You don't see fine lines. So for this patient, what I did was two procedures. Patients have to understand this. This area is very difficult to treat. And most of the times, and the older the patient is, chances are we're going to need more than one procedure. And they have to understand and accept that. Uh, so this lady, I did a filler here, a tear trough filler, and I did mesotherapy for the dark circles. And I got really beautiful results. I don't get this perfect, I'm being very honest, this perfect of a result we don't get with everyone. She has good skin, she has good genetics, she's quite young. So I got, I would say 95, 98% improvement, which we might not see with patients like this. So looking at this patient, again, think with me, please. 
Do you see the groove under the eye, the tear trough? Yes, you do. There's a tear trough here. Do you see dark circles? Mm, not really. It's more shadowing here if you focus correctly. But you do see skin laxity. The skin is lax. Uh, this can benefit from meso. Uh, however, this patient decided that she wanted the filler alone. And she was happy with it, which again is perfectly fine. As long as they feel good and happy with the result, they don't have to go all the way. Perfect does not need to be achieved. Okay, so I would have advised her to do a little bit more meso to get rid of the fine lines. In this area, I would not use even the softest of fillers. So here you're gonna need mesotherapy. This lady, even more challenging. As you can see, she has bags under her eyes. I recommended a blepharoplasty. However, she was not interested in surgery and you have to cater for patients like that. She is fully in her right to say, you know what? I don't wanna go all the way and do a surgical procedure, figure something out for me. And that's what we did. I did a combination of a tear trough filler as I've done for the previous patients, the tear trough filler I put here. And the way I molded it and placed it, it was to kind of even out this prolapsing fat pad that you can see in the upper part of the photo. So you sculpt, you fill fat around it so that it's less visible instead of removing the bags as we would in surgery. This is a temporary fix, but it can push her surgery two years at least. Something else I did for this lady was Botox. And you can see that it affected the line, the, the, the mobility here when she's smiling. You can see that this is not lifting up because of Botox is keeping everything together. So we finished the part about the procedural uh, rejuvenation. Uh, I think we are a bit late on schedule. I'll try to speed up. So uh, oculoplastic surgery, lacrimal system and orbit apart. Again, we're only talking eyelid and mostly cosmetic. It's not just cosmetic. Eyelid is never just cosmetic. Most of the times it can be functional more often than not. A blepharoplasty, as I said, if they have excess skin on the margins, they will have reduced peripheral vision. And in decent countries, <laughs> decent countries, unfortunately, um, not our country in most cases, if you give a visual field, if you as an optometrist to a visual field and show them, you know, their visual field is restricted because of this extra skin, insurance will cover a blepharoplasty and it will not only improve their look and their self-esteem, it will improve their vision. And in many cases, older patients, that's all they really care about. They just want to see better. Uh, the second kind of surgery that I want to allude to uh, is ptosis surgery, okay? Ptosis, drooping of the eyelid, very important, very difficult surgery. I'll talk a little bit more about that. We also deal with complications from previous procedures, whether they are ours, much less common if it's an oculoplastic surgeon, or from other surgeons sending us ptosis cases to fix, for example. Also reconstruction after tumors because tumors can affect the eyelids as well. Uh, we also have a big role in uh, enucleation or evisceration. Apart from doing those procedures as oculoplastic surgeons, we also um, coordinate quite a lot with the ocularists. So those of you who want to be ocularists, it's very important to know that your primary point of contact is going to be the oculoplastic surgeon. You need to tell us, you need to let us know if the volume is enough for you to be able to put a prosthesis, if the orbit is um, if the orbit is uh, not filled enough, we can put an implant, we can, uh, we can do a fat graft. The eyelid position is very important. If the eyelid is retracted and it cannot support the prosthesis, it's gonna keep slipping. So that's also something to keep in mind. What about blepharoplasty? Uh, I'm gonna start speeding up a bit. If you need me to slow down, just send in a text to, the, uh, to Amir and he will let me know. Uh, so, uh, a blepharoplasty, you can do upper lid alone, lower lid alone, or a combined upper and lower lid procedure. Uh, here, we've done an upper lid blepharoplasty. As you can see, she wanted a very natural look. She just wanted it to not cover her eye. This lady did a lower lid bleph. She had under eye bags. She was quite young, actually. She's not as, as old as she looks up here. As you can see here, she looks quite significantly uh, younger. We got rid of the fat pads. We 
We got rid of the sagging skin, and hence we got rid of the puffiness, puffy look of, of the eyes. This is a combined procedure, upper and lower lid blepharoplasty. So we can do this in the same setting. This is actually my mom. I operated on my mom a few years back. And fortunately, she's happy uh, with the result. Um, sometimes upper and lower lid blep uh, are not enough to, to make your patient happy. This gentleman wanted an even younger look and we can do that. Uh, so this guy, I did upper lid blepharoplasty, lower lid blepharoplasty, as long as, uh, along with a mid face lift, as you can see, there's a lift effect in, in the lower, in the lower eyelid, uh, three months post-op, I did Botox for him as well. And this is why you see this big difference because this took time. It was a graded approach. It needs patience. It needs realistic expectations and commitment. So two says drooping of the upper lid, unilateral or bilateral, congenital or acquired. These, I'm assuming everybody knows that. Now, very important, the etiology of two says can be very variable. It can be myogenic, neurogenic, aponeurotic, mechanical, or traumatic. You don't go operating and doing procedures on people who have a myogenic ptosis. This can be treated medically. And that's why it's very important for an oculoplastic surgeon to assess cases of ptosis to determine the etiology before determining the management. Sometimes we do a CT of the thorax. Sometimes we do uh, labs for my, to rule out my senior gravis. And these things you have to coordinate as an oculoplastic surgeon with a neurologist as well. So I wouldn't want honestly an optometrist to um, say, tell the patient they have a diagnosis or a management plan for, for the ptosis. This, I advise you to stay away from, really. Just tell them you have a droopy lid. I suggest that you go get expert advice and see what the cause is to know what the treatment is. It's different from blepharoplasty. It's not strictly surgical. And this surgery, even the best surgeons, it's a headache. I'm telling you it's a headache, and now you will see why. It's not an easy procedure to do, even in the best hands. So as I said, it depends on many factors. This lady has bilateral upper lip ptosis, and sometimes it's, it's unilateral, as you saw in the previous slide. And sometimes they simply wanted for, most of the time, ptosis, they wanted for functional purposes rather than cosmetic. But cosmetic, you know, it's, it's an, um, an extra bonus. Different procedures are done for different uh, severities. Minimal ptosis has a separate procedure than moderate ptosis and severe ptosis. This is beyond the scope of this talk, but just in general, what I'm trying to say is the more severe the ptosis, the more challenging the surgery and the more challenging the post-op care and expectations. So it's a very wide spectrum and it's something to be very careful with because even though eyelid surgery in general, ectropion, entropion, blepharoplasty, whatever you want, lateral tarsus, they all have risks, namely infection, bleeding, over or under correction. We'll talk about reduced vision, but ptosis is one of the more worrisome ones because you have a chance of lag of thalamus and hence exposure keratopathy, keratitis, possibly up to and including losing an eye if it's not done properly. It can be asymmetrical. Symmetry is very hard to predict in those surgeries. Like you do a perfect job, you're happy intra-op, and then you go at night and you can't sleep because these patients are sedated. It's done under local anesthesia with sedation and you rely on the patient to open their eyes uh, even within the procedure to be able to assess the lid height properly. And these are sleepy patients who are sedated. Sometimes they overdo the opening. Sometimes they're too sleepy to open them properly. Also remember that we have local anesthetic injected in there, which distorts the anatomy, which makes it a little bit harder to predict what you're gonna get post up. And that's why these patients are likely to get repeat procedures, much more likely than any other eyelid surgical cases. Uh, now, uh, one small word about uh, vision threat to vision, reduced vision. When they ask me, you know, if I do an eyelid surgery, what are my risks of losing my eyesight? Uh, what I tell my patients, it's uh, less of a chance than you being killed, not hit by a car, just walking outside your house in a quiet street. It's a one in a 10,000 chance, okay? But sometimes people don't even like to hear that. So I go for the car example again. 
this is what I'm talking about when I say uh, send people to the right subspecialist. Okay, so this lady underwent a lower lip blepharoplasty elsewhere, and she came to me looking like this. As you can see, she has frank ectropion. It doesn't just look aesthetically unacceptable. This was a functional nightmare for her. She had exposure, she had tearing all the time, she had foreign body sensation all the time, and she was very, very unhappy. Um, I managed to fix this with a later, something we call a lateral tarsal strip, which means I attached the tendon to the orbital rim up here somewhere, if you can see my pointer. Now, this lady was lucky because I did not need to use a skin graft. In many cases, we're going to have to need skin grafts to make up for this deficiency. So her surgeon overcorrected, removed too much skin, and now I need more skin. And if I needed more skin, I should have gotten a, a graft. And grafting skin is not pleasant in this area because it takes a lot of time to heal and to even out. And it's quite traumatic, especially to a person who had started out going for a purely cosmetic plastic procedure. And of course, before I go on, um, correcting with a second procedure, chances are it will not give you the beautiful result the, that you would get had you, been, had you done it in one procedure. Repeat procedures, you have fibrotic tissue, the surgery is more challenging, it's less predictable, and you get less optimal results than if the proper person had done it in the first time. Now, I also mentioned that eyelids get tumors like everywhere else in the body. And you can see here, this gentleman came to me and you can see this ugly looking mass on his lower lid quite slow growing, if you will start thinking with me. This grow very slowly over the span of years, several years. You can see the pearly margins, the flipped on margins, you can see the scaling, and you can appreciate loss of lashes. When you see those signs, these are signs of malignancy. These are, these are alarming signs. Now, since his um, course was very long and it proceeded over a very long I kind of guessed it would be a basal cell carcinoma, and you would be able to guess that as well. When you see these patients as optometrists, they tell you, oh, it's barely growing. Okay, they need a biopsy. You don't wait for it to become this big. This patient, I had to remove the entire mass. And when you remove this entire mass in a basal cell carcinoma after we diagnose by biopsy, you need four millimeters from the left side, four millimeters extra from the right side and four from the lower margin, meaning I'm removing a tremendous amount of tissue. And a simple procedure is not gonna fix that. I'm gonna need to reconstruct, uh, you need to revise your, your eyelid anatomy. We have the anterior lamella very briefly and the posterior lamella. The anterior lamella is the skin and the muscle. The posterior lamella is the tarsus and conjunctiva. So the first step was to take a flap it's called a huge flap from the upper eyelid. So basically what I did, at barra'at lil upper eyelid with tarsus and conjunctiva, which I attached to the lower lid. And above that, I took a graft from the other eyelid, his other eye, I took a skin graft and sutured it on here, if you can appreciate it. This flap has to stay in place for six weeks for it to hold and to form the lower lid. And after six weeks, we separate this flap. Very, the, the second procedure is actually quite simple. It's just snipping the flap. And this is what you get after three months when this is done properly. I would like to thank you all for your attention. Again, thank you very much VCA for hosting and I am ready for questions if you have any. Thank you so much, Dr. Jardy. Please, if anyone has any question, write it down. أنا بدي أشكر دكتور جودي على هيدي المحاضرة الحلوة وما لي شيء تسمحوا لي بدي أقول كلمة قبل ما ما يتسأل الأسئلة مثل ما شفتوا خلال هيدي الخمس سنين Vision Care Association كانت بمكان وصارت بمكان آخر وهلا Vision Care Association صارت Country Member بال World Council of Optometry يعني بتمثل لبنان بمجلس البصريات العالمي هيدا الشيء ما اجى من فراغ هيدا الشيء اجى من شغل وتعب وجهد على مدى سنين وكرمال هيك انا بدي اذكر شيء كثير مهم 
انه دكتور لما جدي كانت من اول الدكاتره يلي كانوا عم يدعمونا بشكل مجاني وبدي اصير على هذا الموضوع وكانت تطلع معنا على الكامبينز لانه بعض الكامبينز نحن بحاجه لافثالمولوجيست يكونوا معنا اذا بدنا نشوف الكاتاراكس بدنا نشوف الريتينا الى ما هنالك فدكتور لما جدي من اول الافثالمولوجيست يلي دعموا فيجن كير اسوشيشن وبعتقد انه هي لها فضل على فيجن كير اسوشيشن آه انه وصلت اليوم لهيدا المستوى. ثانك يو دكتور لما كنت معنا بالاول اليوم انت معنا وان شاء الله بالمستقبل رح نكون سوا آه اكثر واكثر لحتى نعلي مستوى الاوبتومتري بلبنان وبكل المنطقه. ثانك يو لك امير بس حب زيد شغله صغيره على إلسا مزبوط انا كنت معكم بالاول ببداياتكم بس انا امنت فيكم لسبب لانه يو هاف ا فيجن يو هاف ا بلان وتثبت هيدا الشيء ثبتت انه انا ما حق بنظرتي ل بي سي اي از از جمعيه بانه بعد خمس سنين مش بس عندكم كل هول الاكنولجمنتس عم تعملوا educational activities and this is something that's overlooked by نقابات, by جمعيات, by all kinds of institutions. وأنا بهنيكم على هيدا الشيء. Thank you, Doctor. رح أترك المجال لمايا تسأل لي questions. Okay, Doctor. So the first question. They say if Botox was done once, the injection should be repeated regularly, otherwise the case will get worse. Is this true? Okay, so Botox, مثل ما قلنا, it's reversible temporary it's temporary paralysis of, of a muscle. So yes, the effect will go away. Uh, the company says Botox, Allergan, the original one, the first uh, patent, uh, no financial interest, by the way. Uh, they say on the company, they tell you it lasts three months. Uh, when you go to your typical um, aesthetic procedure center, they're going to tell you six months and nine months. That is inaccurate. It lasts three to six months. And the more you inject, relax, the longer they're going to last. Muscle memory. You're training your muscles to be more relaxed. You're training your face to smile less or frown less, actually. That's what I'm more concerned about. So if you're using the proper product, okay, that's very important. Not the Chinese products, for example. Uh, these develop resistance, okay, because they have uh, preservatives in them that stimulate resistance in the body to the Botox. And in those cases, it will stop working as well. But if you're using the proper product, relax, the effects will last longer and longer after every single session. Nice, thank you. So the second question, what is the best routine to follow in order to take care of our face and the area around the eyes? Okay, so as I said, uh, it should be a ritual, okay? Part of your daily ritual uh, in the evening and in the morning. It takes you, I promise you, not more than four or five minutes. So I will tell you what I do. So what I do is the cleansing, daily cleansing. I prefer gels. I don't use soap on my face. Soap-free products are best. Uh, you, after you clean properly, you dry, and then you apply your products. Products you can really mix and match. I like to use different things. I use retinol-based products, vitamin C-based products, um, anti-acne treatments like PD Balance, for example, which fixes the flora of the skin and decreases any blemishes. So mix and match. But off the top of your head, if you're going to a pharmacy and buying an off-the-counter cream, just check the chronic acid. It's an excellent excellent component okay as long as it's high in hyaluronic acid you're on track that's the bullet point i just take it and um, the other thing as i mentioned vitamin c daily for what very simple one every day it is magical it has an antioxidant effect and it gives a lot of flow morning very important as i said spf 50 that's the least you can do for your face if it's a very sunny day renew them every every three to four hours it's not enough to put it one thing. and these are the basics the very basics of skincare if you do that in your 20s i'm down i'm now in which it now that the platinate martin bellish but key but both of first or martin also frequently thank you so much so uh we have another question we're just saying that they can lift eyelids 
So whose job is it? Uh, sorry, can you pick a Sure. Uh, we saw optometrists saying that they can lift eyelids. So whose job is it? Hello, there's something called eyelid crutches, which mostly optometrists do, but that's something you attach to the eyelid and it's not a procedure and it's it's not surgical and it's nothing permanent. Okay, it's a crutch. The solution for ptosis is surgical. And we talk when we talk about surgery, it means breaking skin. Breaking skin, you have to be a medical doctor, and it's a surgical procedure. Um, uh, what I was saying, even among surgeons, I mean, plastic surgeons shy away from ptosis cases. They send them to us. They send them to oculoplastic surgeons because these cases are very delicate, very easy to get problems with those patients, and you need to be equipped to solve them should you have any issues. So in my opinion, ptosis surgery should not be done by a plastic surgeon, should not be done by an optometrist. That's a fact, actually. And uh, I would go for an oculoplastic surgeon every time, especially for ptosis. Okay. So another question, what is the rate of success of leferoplasty and what are the risks? So there is, as we said, infection, bleeding, bruising, as with, with all uh, eyelid procedures, uh, the, the significant risk, risk, risk for vision, as I said, it's less than one in 10,000. So it's a pretty you know, uh, rewarding, a safe procedure in the right hand. If you know what you're doing, you don't get an orbital hemorrhage. And those are the things that can cause vision problems. When you know your anatomy, it's a very safe procedure. We do it in clinic under local anesthesia in a minor operating room. Success rates are very high. They're in the 90s. Um, let's say, nine, I, I can't give you an exact number, definitely in the 90s. And even if you need to uh, retouche, you know, uh, to touch up on your surgery, it's not a big deal, provided you were undercorrected, not overcorrected. There's always a small possibility of a repeat surgery, but in the right hand, this is really quite minimal and easily fixed. Perfect. Okay, so last question. Can uh, any inject injection or filler around the eye cause trabismus or it's only about droopy lids? Uh, you mean Botox, okay? So fillers give volume, fillers can cause problems in the orbit, they can cause uh, embolus, etc. You're talking about Botox. Uh, so Botox can cause tosses and it can cause strabismus if you go close enough to the eye. It's less commonly seen than ptosis, but I have seen it, unfortunately, with uh, inexperienced inject uh, people injecting them. Okay. Thank you so much, doctor, for this informative lecture. Thank you.